we turn our attention back to our gospel lesson from the gospel of St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is the word of the Lord. The victorious life, living out the victory of Easter morning over death and grave and the gift of eternal life. What does that mean? Well, let me take you back to those first few days, weeks, and months at the closing of the Second World War. We had bombed cities out of existence, and all across the continent of Europe, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of children who'd been orphaned. Their mom and dad had either died uh, in direct battle or as a result of the bombings. But there are just all these children with no parents. There is poverty everywhere across the continent, and famine has broken out. Now, the Allies are trying to do everything they can to gather up these children, to put them in makeshift uh, orphanages, sometimes uh, old warehouses, old factories, uh, hospitals, whatever it is. But all across the continent, there are all these kids. And across the continent, there was a common phenomenon. These kids would not sleep. They would stay awake all night long. Uh, many of them would just sob and cry all night long. Some of them would scream. Uh, uh, they would be terrified by dreams or nightmares if they had slipped into sleep for a few seconds. It was a horrific experience, not only for the children, but for everybody trying to take care of them. And they were trying to find some way to calm these children down. So they would go through the wreckage, they would find a doll, they would give a doll to a little girl hoping that maybe that would calm her down, but it didn't work. They would try to find maybe some stuffed animal or something, they would give it to one of the children hoping they could adopt it and calm them, but it didn't work. They would find a, a blanket, you know, kids like to have those blankies, and they would give it to the child and it wouldn't work. And they tried this and they tried that and it didn't work. They wouldn't sleep, and they cried, and they screamed, and they were terrified. One night in an orphanage in Poland, not knowing anything else to do, one of the workers cut a slice of bread and handed it to one of the kids, thinking, well, maybe you know, if you had something to eat before you went to bed, it would relax you and calm you. And that little one grabbed that piece of bread and held it to her breast and fell fast asleep slept all night. So the next night, this worker took a whole loaf of bread and sliced it up and gave as many slices as he could to every child that he could. Each child grabbed it, held onto it, and fell asleep, slept all night. And all across Europe, then care workers began to cut up bread and give bread to these children and they would take it, and they would hold it, and they would fall asleep and sleep all night. They didn't eat it. It wasn't a snack before you go to bed. It wasn't so if you woke up in the middle of the night and you've been hungry so long, uh, maybe you could eat it and it would calm you or comfort it. No, it would still be there. They would still be cuddling it the very next day. And what they began to realize is by giving them a piece of bread that they could go to bed with, they were giving them something that was immeasurably valuable. Hope for tomorrow. Tomorrow you will have something to eat. Tomorrow you will live through the day. And hope brought them peace. 
Now, there's going to come a day for all of us, unless Jesus comes first, where we're going to lie down one last time. The Bible refers to death again and again and again and again as sleep. For you to sleep, we will take you to a cemetery, a Latin word that refers to a soldier's barrack, where the soldiers go at night to sleep. So when that last time comes and you will lie down and sleep, will you lie down in peace? Will you lie down in calm? Will you lie down in confidence or fear? Peter wrote to us in his first general epistle that we are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can lie down in peace because we will lie down in hope of the resurrection through our Lord Jesus Christ. We will lie down victorious, already the winners. We have vanquished death and grave. It cannot have us. It cannot hold us. Its power has been destroyed, trampled under the feet of Jesus. That hope, that confidence, that faith is what brings us peace. But let's look at the disciples on this original Easter day. The text begins by telling us they are back in that upper room where they celebrated the Passover, where Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body, and gave them the cup and said, this is my blood. They're back in that room. They may be remembering that night and all that's happened since then, the, the betrayal and the arrest in Gethsemane, the trial, uh, all of the beatings, and then the crucifixion and the burial, and now this crazy news coming out of the morning from the women that he's not there, that he's alive, that he's risen from the dead. The gospel has been preached. The good news has reached them. The truth of the resurrection is known to them. So there they are out in the streets preaching and teaching and proclaiming and telling everybody they can that Jesus Christ is alive. He's not dead. He's won. We're victorious. God has won this victory for us. There they are. No. There they are. Locked behind the doors because they're afraid. And sometimes we're not living the victorious life. Sometimes we're not out there with boldness and courage and confidence. Sometimes we're not facing life's trials and problems and struggles with the confidence that we have eternal life. That today's struggles are just a momentary affliction compared to the eternity which Jesus Christ has won for us. That this life is opportunity to bring service and glory to the God who will bring eternal life to us. No, when things begin to happen, fear begins to crush us and, and it paralyzes us and it draws us back. Proverbs 29 says that fear is like a snare, it's like a trap. You know, you, you, you step in it and it closes and you, you can't get away. And now that you're trapped, now that you can't escape, Whatever danger, whatever threat comes after you, you can't get away. You're stuck. And Proverbs says that's the power and that's the reality of fear. It puts you in a place and it won't let you out. And you feel like you have no protection. You have no safety and you have no answer. But you need to keep reading Proverbs 29. It says, but those who trust in the Lord will dwell in safety. Those who are afraid will lock the doors and live in fear and paralysis. And it will crush their spirits and it will rob their faith. But those who trust in the Lord, who believe in the resurrection, those who live the victorious life, they will dwell in safety because they know they are in the hands of God and God will keep them forever. But have you ever wondered why are they so afraid? 
Now, the text says that they are afraid of the Jews, but why are they afraid of the Jews? Is there a greater underlying fear here that we need to understand? Realize their theology, realize their day, their time, and their culture. Remember when they see a man that was born blind and the debate breaks out? Who's to blame? Who's responsible for this? Did this man sin? Did, did somehow maybe in the womb uh, he sinned and, and God made him blind from birth? Or did God know that, you know, he was 5 or, or 10 or 15 or 35, he was going to commit this grievous sin? And since God knew that was coming, he punished him even in the womb and he's born blind. Is this his fault? And of course, the other end of the argument is, no, it's got to be his parents' fault. You see, his mom and dad are, are, are horrible sinners. They've, they, they've committed some grievous sin against God, and to punish them, God gave them a child born blind. It's their fault. It's the consequences of their sin. That's why this happened. Now, imagine you lived in a world where if something went wrong, everybody always said to you, what'd you do? I mean, I've had multiple heart surgeries, so I must really be a bad person. And if I'm really a bad person, why do you let me be your pastor? You better think about that. Last year, my wife had a devastating car accident. She better fess up, better tell me what's going on, what happened, see. And every time something goes wrong in your life, something bad happens, you go through some negative experience, it's because God is punishing you. Now you can say, oh, pastor, that's not biblical. Oh, yes, it is. Have you read Leviticus 26? If not, go home and read it. Leviticus 26 is abundantly clear. It's not confusing. It's not hard to understand. God says, if you don't listen, if you don't obey, if you don't do what I tell you, I will punish you. I will bring pain and misery and even death to you because you will not listen and you will not obey. So whose fault is it that this man was born blind? His or his mom and dad's? So if God is always punishing those who do wrong, is that why they're afraid of the Jews? Are they afraid that the Jewish rulers will be the instruments of God to punish them for what they've done? One of them betrayed. But remember the upper room when Jesus said, hey, one of you is going to betray me? And then one by one, they all said, Lord, is it me? Now, you know, if you're confident you're not going to betray somebody, you don't say that, do you? You don't ask that question. You don't walk up to your spouse each day and say, do you think I'm going to be faithful today? What do you think? I mean, there ought to be some confidence there, right? Right? There ought to be some level of trust and there ought to be a, a commitment of love that makes that question meaningless. Of course I'm going to be faithful to you today. I love you. So why does each of them go, uh, are you talking about me? Did each of them realize that under the right circumstances they could betray him? Peter denies. I don't even know the man. Now maybe the rest of them don't deny because they all ran away. So that's not much better. So what happens when your wife has a bad car accident? You send her a nice card and some flowers and, you know, you wait for her to get home and make dinner even if it takes weeks and multiple surgeries? Or do you go to the hospital? I mean, are you there when she needs you? When your kids are in trouble, when they're hurt, when things go wrong, you know, do you send them a text, mom and dad praying for you, hope it works out? You show up. 
You're there. Even if it's sit quietly, even if it's to cry with them, if it's to listen to them rant and rave and dump all their emotions, that's okay. Your mom and dad, dump away. But you're there. These guys weren't there. They ran away. Bunch of cowards. So what is God going to do now to these cowards, to these deniers, to these men who aren't sure whether they were the betrayers or not? Is God going to punish them? That's what the Bible says. Maybe it's not so much the Jews they're afraid of as they're afraid of what God may bring to them through those people. We have messed up. We have stepped now into the snare of fear and we can't get away. We can't escape. And it's easy now for us to spend another 10 or 15 minutes in a sermon beating up on them and criticizing them and belittling them for their lack of faith and confidence. But how about we just look in the mirror? How many times in your life has something gone wrong, something been taken from you, you've gone through some painful experience, something didn't work out, some door closed, you went through some pain, through some suffering, through some disease, some negative a moment, and you turned your mind and your heart to God, and you say to yourself, what did I do to deserve this? You turn to God and you say, why are you doing this to me? Or you turn to God and you say, why aren't you doing something to make this better? As if somehow Good Friday and Easter morning never took place. As if Jesus saying, it is finished, all punishment, all consequences, all the wrath of God, all of Leviticus 26 has been fulfilled, accomplished, consumed, and done. Yes, God punishes sin. But that's where he did it. Not there. We're not still fighting for the victory. We live from the victory. So Jesus has to show up and make this clear. Three times in this gospel lesson, Jesus shows up in the upper room. Now that in and of itself would startle me and amaze me. We're in a closed room, locked doors, there he is. Wouldn't that stun you? But there he is. Three times, each time he shows up, he says the same thing. He shows up and he says, peace be with you. You're afraid of the Jews. You're afraid of one another. Your relationships are broken. That's a whole other sermon, but go back and Look at the relationship amongst the disciples right after the resurrection. They aren't getting along. It isn't working out. They're all kind of blaming each other. Well, you ran away. Well, you ran away too. Well, you denied. Yeah, but you weren't even there. At least I was there. It's no accident that right after Jesus pronounces peace, he starts to talk about forgiveness. I have forgiven you. Now you need to forgive one another. Peace is a Greek word. It's a noun. comes from a verb. The verb means to join two things together. We have a tendency to think of peace as the absence of something. It's the absence of conflict. It's the absence of war. It's the uh, absence of discord. It's the absence of this brokenness. But the Bible has the opposite understanding. It's not the absence of something. It's the presence of something in your life. And in this case, it's Jesus. Death had separated them 
the resurrection has brought them back together. Jesus showing up, stepping into their lives again, living bodily. Go ahead, guys. If you need to touch me, touch me. If you need some proof that this is a living body, go ahead. But he shows up and reunites and reconciles himself with them. All that separated us, your sin, has been washed clean. It's gone and it's forgotten. And that which would separate us, death and grave, has been destroyed and conquered. And God and man are joined together again. And we are at peace. And Jesus says to all of our marriages and our families and our friendships and as brothers and sisters in Christ who join together here, we are at peace. We are joined together in what Christ has accomplished on this Easter day. And wouldn't it be wonderful if all of a sudden here in this sanctuary, in this moment, Jesus showed up. And all of your fears and all of your problems and all of your struggles, he looked at you and he said, peace be with you. Well, I would suggest he just did. Take and eat. This is my body. just as much my body as showed up in that upper room for Thomas. It's just as much my body as it showed up and talked to Mary Magdalene outside the tomb. It's just as much my body as walked down that road to Emmaus and talked to those two disciples. Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament, and it's my blood. It's not like my blood. It doesn't represent my blood. It is my blood. Jesus showed up. That's our faith, and that's his promise. And when Jesus showed up in your life for the remission of your sins, to reconcile you with himself and his Father and the Spirit, to reconcile us one with another, how do we end? After we acknowledge by the power of the Word of God that bread and wine become body and blood, the pastor says to you, may the peace of the Lord be with you for a couple of seconds as you come to the table. No. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And you know what's great about pastoral ministry? Is all these people say right back to you and also with you. And we feast in the presence, the body and blood of God himself. Just as he appeared miraculously in an upper room, he appears miraculously in bread and wine. Now may the eating and drinking of our Lord's very own body and blood, now that you have encountered the presence of the living, risen, victorious Jesus, may it strengthen you in that one true faith, at least until tomorrow when you go back to work. Or how about unto life everlasting? May it strengthen you in that faith when you lie down that last time and pass through death and grave to life eternal. The pastor makes the sign of the cross. Here's the reconciliation of God. Here's where all sin is forgiven and atoned for. Here's where we are washed clean and made new. And tells you, you can depart from the table in peace. Each time. Every time. 
This is the victorious life. Peace. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in our weakness, our sinfulness, we allow fear to interrupt, to disrupt, and to diminish our faith and our confidence. Call us back again and again and again to your word, to your promise, to the truth. The truth will set us free from the snares of fear. Call us again and again and again to your table to feast on the body and blood of your Son and our Savior, Jesus, that we might find peace in his presence, joined together through faith with him in his victory. We pray, Lord, for those who need your healing grace. We pray for Dave Bauman, Mark Heimsoth. Continue to pray for my dad, for Pastor Fritz, for Solomon Dale, Paul Ryan, for Christine Lursky, who's Deb's mom, and for all those, Lord, that are known to us in our hearts, all the people we know and love that we cry out to you in Jesus' name. Grant them all a whole, quick, and complete recovery from all that afflicts them of body and soul. We pray, Lord, for Barb and her family as they mourn the loss of her Aunt Christy, for Diane and her family as they mourn her sister-in-law, Becky. To all who grieve and mourn this day, draw them closer to an empty tomb. To hear once again the glorious message of the angels, he is not here, he is risen. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Help us to see Jesus alive, sitting at the right hand of our Heavenly Father, knowing and trusting that He will return in all His glory to judge both the living and the dead and then grant resurrection and life everlasting to His church. Help us to believe in the promise of a living, risen Jesus that even though we die, yet shall we live. As he lives, we shall live. Give us this hope, this confidence, and this peace. Lord, we continue to hear stories of violence and shootings and death. We pray for peace and an end to this violence. We pray, Lord, for the church to step up and to proclaim Jesus Christ to a broken world. Give wisdom and discernment to all who serve in authority over us so that they rule us and govern us in a way that restores peace and harmony. For your instruments of safety, our armed forces, our police officers, our firefighters, civil servants, first responders, however, wherever they serve, Lord, watch over them, bless them, keep them safe. When they've accomplished their duties, they fulfilled their responsibilities, then bring them home and reunite them with their loved ones. Be with all the victims, Lord, of the storms and earthquakes and violence all around the world, people who have lost possessions and loved ones. Grant them peace and provision. Help them to rebuild and to restore their lives. Continue to be with us here at New Song as we seek a shepherd. Guide and direct us, Holy Spirit, so that we find that individual that is your will and under you and with your strength and power, he will lead us so that together we build your kingdom in this place. These and all things, Heavenly Father, we raise before you in the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you 
his peace. Amen.